Thank you, Brother Richard. And again, thank you, Devin Park, so much for your hospitality, your kindness. You've been wonderful and studious men and women of the Word of God. I've been able to comment to that to Pastor Terry, just the way you've paid attention so well. And uh, again, I do bring you greetings on behalf of Calvary Baptist Church. I was talking to the other men that helped lead our church today, and they wanted to know how you guys were doing, and very thankful, and it was with a great joy that I was able to tell my team how you have so generously given us that gift of love this morning, which means so much to us. If you continue to pray as we step, continue to press forward, my biggest prayer request, and uh, it's just interesting, listen to Brother Don and give his heart and the passion you feel for the field that God has called you to. And so if you would pray that we would find that Ukrainian couple or family that would join us in Newfoundland, we're actually trying to get two Filipino couples or families to join us. The Filipino community is actually the largest immigrant group that's moving to Newfoundland. And the second one, as shared with Brother Seth, is Punjabi Indian. And so we're desperately asking the Lord to bring a couple or a family to Newfoundland to help us in those areas. So we really covet your prayers for those things as we see God bringing the nations to Toronto and to all these uh, big cities and as well to the East Coast. And I'm sure you've even noticed it here in Fredericton and you've seen the changes and things that are happening. And These are opportunities for us as Seth has challenged us. And so I thank you for that. Thank you, brother, for sharing your heart. And uh, it's been a joy not only for me to be amongst you but to hear the different reports because the one thing that you can pray for me about is when you're in Newfoundland, I love my home province, I love my city, but it is an island, and you can often feel very much isolated and alone, and uh, it is good to travel in the sense that you are reminded that we're not alone, and God is working. And I even want to encourage you, because you're here at Fredericton, I promise you as someone that has traveled almost 100,000 miles this year, all across the United States and Canada and other parts of the world, that God is working. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church, and it's not going to. And I want you to be encouraged, even though sometimes we can only see our little corner of the wall, that God is working, and for that we are forever thankful. And so, as we finish up tonight, I'd like you to start in the book of Genesis. As we bring the train into the station, so to speak, we've talked about our theme of being compelled by his love, and sometimes... The Lord Jesus needs to correct our understanding to make sure when we are compelled by his love that it's actually his love we're compelled by. Saturday night, we were reminded that if we're going to be compelled by his love, it needs to be a love that's in action. And we've learned about the compassion of Jesus Christ. And then this morning, one of my favorites, I love John chapter 17. I am committed to trying to put it to memory along with the book of Jude uh, by the end of this year. And I've just been so blessed as I preached through John 17 at my home church. I didn't do Anthony Burgess. I didn't preach 145 sermons on it. I don't know if my church could have bore that or not. Uh, but um, I did preach almost one sermon per verse. So that's long-winded enough and um, really enjoyed that. But tonight is one of the things that I've been really thrilled about. And what I love about the Word of God, and especially I just want to encourage you, if you'll give yourself to steady reading of the Word of God, I promise you this, it will never grow stale. It'll never get old. You will always discover that God is way deeper than you ever give Him credit for. And I love this because I've been reading the book of John since I was a little boy. And just as I've been preaching through this book to discover some things in the passion account of the cross from John's perspective has opened my eyes in ways that I never thought possible. And I think it's a fitting way for us to finish tonight as we consider that Jesus was bound or taken captive so that you and I can be set free. And there's no better way to be compelled by his love than to visit afresh and anew the reminder of what you and I have in the gospel. But to do that, I actually want to start back at the beginnings in Genesis chapter 3. And if you remember, this is the account of the fall Chapters 1 and 2 gives us that glorious uh, beginnings of the Bible. And I love the fact that the Bible never seeks to prove the existence of God. It just simply begins, in the beginning, God created 
There was never an attempt to prove his existence. He is. And yet, very quickly, we can't find the fact that things go horribly wrong. In Genesis chapter 3, Moses is the author. He's likely been given this revelation as the Israelites, by the way, have been delivered from Egypt, and they're traveling on their way to the, um, what will become their land, and the, and the uh, idea there, and God moves Moses to write those first five books of the Bible, basically to explain their beginnings and why God will ask them to do what he does as they move into the promised land. And so when you read the book of Genesis, remember, this is being written to the 12 tribes of Israel as they are traveling towards the promised land. This is him quantifying what they have known through oral history for centuries. And so Moses writes, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the servant said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, now watch this, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be, desire, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife did a curious thing. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. It's the first negative emotion that we encounter as the beginnings of the Bible. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said to him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And oh, how they fall. The man said, the woman you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And so then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the fields. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now catch this, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he, or but he, will rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field." By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, in knowing good and evil." And now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, if you would, let's go to the New Testament, to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. In a few minutes, I want to read the first 12 verses. But to set this up for us this evening, it is practically the end of October. 
Now, I don't know about you, if any men or ladies here, but I am married to the world's biggest Christmas fanatic in Atlantic Canada. My wife obsesses over Christmas. Christmas music has been playing in our home. Once Remembrance Day is done, the decorating starts, and everything's at a fever pitch. Now, I tease her about it immensely, but the truth of the matter is I enjoy it quite a bit. She turns our home into a Christmas wonderland, and I love it more and more every year, especially as our family grows and we have grandbabies that come in, and I love to watch them marvel at all the twinkling lights and all the things that Debbie creates. But I do tease her quite a bit. But here we are. We're at that time now where after we get past Remembrance Day, you're going to hear various different Christian cliches like every church does. And one of them you're likely to hear, maybe even from Pastor Terry or Pastor Richard or anyone else that preaches here, is the inevitable statement that Jesus was born to die. You'll often hear that. Almost every Christmas, someone's going to say, he was born to die, and indeed he was. So how fitting is it that as we end this conference and as we get ready, November is about to hit us and we're going to get into the throes of the Christmas season, that we would look at this idea that Jesus was indeed born to die. You see, in John chapter 18, 19, and 20, you actually have six sections of John's gospel about the death and the burial of Jesus. And then you'll have that famous conclusion chapter of chapter 21, where Jesus and Peter talk by the shore on the Sea of Galilee. But stuck in between that is chapter 20 and the beginning of chapter 21. And at the end of chapter 20, you have to read all the way, almost to the end of John's gospel, for you to actually find out why did he write it. That is not usually how authors write their books. Usually they tell you at the beginning, this is what I want to talk about. This is what I want you to learn. And then they go about telling you, John just begins with this 18-verse introduction in chapter 1, and then he launches into the life and conversations of Christ with individuals and families and people. But he waits to almost the end to tell you why he wrote it. Here's what he says. John chapter 20, verse 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So, in other words, he says, I've just given you a sampling of his life. But these, which he's predominantly talking of the seven great signs of the book of John and seven great I am statements, he goes, I chose these seven so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So there's his purpose. Here's why I wrote these 21 chapters, so that when you get to the end, you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But then he goes even further and says, here's the result, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So this is his purpose in writing the Gospel of John. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing, you will have life in his name. So let me ask you this evening, and I want to take nothing for granted, even though you're the faithful remnant that are here, and maybe it's assumed you're all believers, but let me ask the question anyway. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And would you say that you have life in his name? And I don't mean some cheap sort of fire insurance. That's not what John is talking about. John is not just talking about having eternal life in the sense of, I know that when I die, I'm going to live forever. The idea is that the moment you meet Jesus, you have life. The joy of the Lord is my strength, as the author said. Is Jesus more than just a man, more than a political revolutionary? Jesus is Lord, but have you submitted to his lordship? And Jesus is Savior, but have you come to him for not only rescue and help, but are you daily coming to him? This is what our brother Don was talking about in his three treasures. See, it's one thing to look back over your shoulder and say, I'm glad Jesus saved me. But sometimes the great tragedy of our churches is if you listen, and I was rebuked, I have three, son, uh, three children, two sons and a daughter, and at Grace Baptist, when I was the pastor in PEI, we would very commonly have testimony time on a Sunday evening, and we had a dear saint of the Lord who lived to be well into his 90s, and he inevitably would always share his testimony, he'd always thank God that in 1972, God saved him. Till one day I'm driving back home after the service with my kids and my boys are sitting there. My middle boy says, Dad, 
I love it when this man says his testimony, but it honestly sounds like God saved him in 1972 and hasn't done a thing for him since. Ouch. Out of the mouths of babes again, right? Do you believe and do you have life in his name? John has, has been moved of God, inspired of God, to show us a side of Jesus. In fact, I would recommend the reason why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, and John is kind of set apart, is because John is really a series of conversations between Jesus Christ with people, real people. I love it. Whether it's his family, like his mother at the wedding of John 2, or one of my heroines of the Bible, the woman at the well in John 4, whether it's what I think is one of the most comical chapters of the Bible, the man born blind in John chapter 9, whether it's the choosing of the 12 disciples in John chapter 1 and 2, then there's the religion of Nicodemus, right? That Pharisee in John 3 or the official son in John 4. Whether Jesus was cleansing a temple or addressing crowds like he does in John chapter 6, whether he's walking on water or feeding thousands. In John's gospel, you were introduced to someone who spoke and taught and saved and confronted, even rebuked his disciples. He challenged the Pharisees, cast out demons, stared down Rome. See, John presents to us Jesus sent from God and yet fully human. And I want you to hang on to that. As I said to you in John chapter 1, he gives us this 18-verse introduction, and then he gives us all of these signs and wonders and these I am statements, and it was very interesting that Don would reference this chapter, because in John chapter 12, everything takes a turn. Everything takes a turn, and you have these big summary statements. Some of the verses Don read to us in his video. Then chapters 13 to 16 is the great farewell discourse. Then John 17, the great consecration prayer. And then you have the passion, the death, burial, and resurrection. And I believe that John's desire, his goal, his prayer, and his mission is that you and I will not just know and believe and trust in Jesus, but he wants us that in knowing, in trusting, in believing, we're going to have life, life in his name, where we're going to be compelled by his love. And wonder of wonders, like his introduction, what you might not know about the Gospel of John is how prevalent the idea is of a garden. Garden is everywhere, especially in the, pra in the passion. It's almost as if John wants you and I to think about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. As he shows us how Jesus, who Paul tells us in Romans is the second Adam, is going to restore everything that was lost in Genesis chapter 3. That's why I read it. Did you see it? Jesus is going to succeed everywhere where Adam failed. So watch this. Jesus enters a garden of his own choosing. Jesus will surrender himself to the will of his father, be betrayed by both Judas and indeed the world, but it's not by force, it's by choice. Now watch this with me. Let me read you the first few verses of John 18, where John says this, when Jesus had spoken these words, so he's finished praying with the disciples on the way through the Kedron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, look at this. He went out with his disciples across the brook Hedron, and there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, and here's why. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And I want you to pay attention to all those words. Then Jesus, now this is my point, right? Knowing all that would happen to him. Now watch the wording here. Came forward and said to them. He's not hiding. He's not holding back. He comes forward and he says to them, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Now watch this. Judas who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. 
And notice, John wants us to know that that statement was to fulfill the word that had been spoken of those whom you, have, whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Now, don't you love Peter? Because Peter springs into action. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And John wants us to know, in parentheses, his name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? So I want you to hang on to that because, again, Jesus enters this garden of his own will. Jesus will drink the cup of suffering, something he's spoken about and prayed about, and it's for our salvation and ultimately for God's glory and his so I want you to look at these verses, and I pray that you and I will see not only who Jesus is, but what he has done for us, because then we'll be compelled by his love. We'll believe and trust in Jesus, and we're going to have eternal life. Now, I get it. I'm an extroverted extrovert. I get it. I love people. I love being around people. People give me energy. I know I'm dramatic and I'm expressive and all these things. But trust me when I tell you, I can have very high highs and low lows. And God knew what he was doing when I married Debbie. Because Debbie is the complete and utter opposite of me. You don't realize, but our brother, you gave me a check for $1,000 for my one mission. And I had to fight back the tears. I'm the type of person that if somebody... Uh, calls me and says, brother, I want to give you $5. I call Debbie and go, can you believe what God done? He's given us $5, right? Um, but I'm also the type of person that if something goes wrong and we have an unexpected bill and something happens and now I didn't see something coming, I call Debbie and I'm crying, look, why is God so mad with us? And what have we done to deserve this wrath? And whereas Debbie is built, that if I called her and said, somebody just gave us a million dollars, you know what Debbie would say? Well, praise the Lord. By God's grace, life will be a little easier now. And if I called Debbie and said, we're busted, we're broken, I've been fired, I got no money, I don't know how we're going to live, we got to be out of the house, you know what my wife would do? Well, life might be a little harder in the immediate, but we're going to trust the Lord. Do you know how incensingly angry that makes me? But I want you to realize whether you're introverted like Debbie or you're extroverted like me, understanding what we have in the gospel compels you, male or female, young or old, extroverted or introverted, it compels you by the love of Jesus Christ. Kent Hughes does a great job of setting up this pastor passage. He says, the ministry of the upper room is over. The Passover table bears the cold remains of the Paschal meal and Judas is gone. The intercessory prayer is ended. With the echoes of the last hymn still floating in the midnight air, Jesus and his disciples have headed for Gethsemane and the cross. And what I've just read to you in these first 12 verses and in chapters 18 and 19 are the imminent events and the ultimate importance because of all the wonderful things promised by Jesus in chapters 13 to 16. How Jesus has promised his disciples eternal life. He's promised the sending of his Holy Spirit as the comforter. He's promised that he would return for them. He's promised to prepare a place for them. He's promised them the treasures of grace and salvation. And it all hangs in the balance of him going to be betrayed and suffering and dying. Don't you love how the Holy Spirit works, that our brother would show a video and that his second treasure was don't waste your suffering? And if you ever want a greater example of someone who didn't waste his suffering, look no further than Jesus, right? So I want you very quickly here this, tonight, if you want to take some um, notes, I want you to notice the difference between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane because we have, number one, a garden revisited Look at that first verse again. It says, they left the upper room and they traveled to a garden. And you'll notice that John is very nondescript. He just tells us it's a garden. He doesn't name it. But he tells us it was a garden or a place where these disciples went often. And you're going to see Christ's lordship and control, even in his choices of the place where he would encounter his captors. The Lord deliberately chose Gethsemane. John's specific mention of it as a garden in verse 1 suggests that the apostle had in mind a deliberate comparison with the original Garden of Eden. And it's unbelievable, the symbols. Let's watch this now. 
Adam began life in a garden, Jesus would come to the end of his life in a garden. Adam in Eden sinned. In Gethsemane, Jesus overcomes sin. Adam in Eden fell. In Gethsemane, Jesus conquers. Adam in Eden hid himself, where in Gethsemane, as we read in our passage, the Lord boldly presents himself. And I love this one. In in the Garden of Eden, a sword is drawn, but in Gethsemane, Jesus tells Peter to put the sword back into its sheath. But notice in verse 1 again, they traveled across the Kedron Kedron Valley, and none of the thing is lost in the symbolism here. John doesn't mention this by accident. It's not an incidental to Jesus' death. Enhancing this uh, uh, symbolism here, John mentions that they left and crossed the Kedron Valley. Now, what time of the year is it? It's Passover. Do you realize that in the first century, they tell us that up to 200,000 lambs would be slaughtered during the Passover. And there was a drain that actually left from the, um, the, the uh, place of offering in the Temple Mount that would go down and drain into the Kedron Valley and would turn the river red with the blood of these sacrifices. So don't miss the the symbolism. Jesus leaves that upper room, walks over to Gethsemane, praying with his disciples. They cross the Kedron Valley where they have to look and see a river running red with blood as Jesus was about to go give up his blood for our sin. In fact, one of the things, if you've ever been to Israel, I've had the joy of going on multiple times. I just unfortunately had to cancel a trip that I was going to take in February with several pastor friends is you will realize how much Jesus was a visual teacher and how much things are right there for us to see. So Jesus is not afraid. This divine poetry, Jesus knows what's going to happen. Now, we know from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is tired. We know that because Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us the details of Jesus praying and passionately pleading with God the Father about what's to come. But I want us to see the passage before us. John wants us to know that Jesus is the one in charge. He chooses to go to this garden. He's not hiding. This was a place they regularly went. But notice what John says. He tells us the hour had come. Now you also know that in the Gospel of John, this expression, the hour, is very important. In John chapter 2, Jesus told his mother Mary, my hour has not yet come. In John chapter 11, when religion and the crowd wanted to take Jesus by force, they couldn't touch him. And John tells us that because his hour has not yet come. But interestingly, in John 12 and following, Jesus told the people and his disciples, my hour has come. In John 17, he prays this. And now John walks us through this hour. And it was a planned hour. It was a willed hour. In fact, what we were about to see is everywhere that Adam failed, I say it again, Jesus will succeed. And this is what John wants us to see. Jesus is not running from power. He's actually the only one in this story in power. Jesus is the only one being obedient to the Father's will. And a few hours from now, he'll cry out, it is finished. Remember when I read Genesis 3.15? Do you know what that's often called? The John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Genesis 3.15 is now about to be fulfilled. John 3.16 is now about to be put into place. Jesus returns to the garden so that hope and life can be offered. It's good news. Tragedy will become triumph. Satan and the world will attack. They'll even rejoice and they'll seek to destroy. And yet in the face of their most grotesque travesties will come the greatest victory ever. Hey, for those of you that are older and we're, we're dealing with even in our current church's dynamics, these worship wars and we're wondering about singing what we call the old hymn of the faith or new hymns. Listen, if you want to help your young people appreciate some of the old hymns of the faith, remind them and place them in these Bible passages. Remember this? I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. And how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. And then I repented of my sins and won the victory. See, in John 18, we're reminded that there's victory in Jesus because he revisits a garden and he's going to turn it all around. But next, 
there's a garden confrontation. Notice what happens. Verse 4, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward to them and said, whom do you seek? And that's after we heard in verse 3 that Judas comes and he's got a garrison, a band of soldiers, and he's got people from the scribes and the Pharisees. Now what you need to realize, where John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is in verses 1 and 2, there's a big gap. Matthew, Mark, and Luke fill in that gap for us. There's the prayer of Gethsemane that takes place there. There's the sleepiness of the disciples. There's the agony of the cross as it comes to bear on Jesus, where he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood, Dr. Luke tells us. And he states that ever-famous line, if there is any way for this cup to pass from me, nevertheless, what? Not my will, but your will be done. But don't again miss the symbolism of Genesis 3. Adam and Eve in the garden speaks to the devil. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane speaks to his father. Adam and Eve lived in a garden of perfection and delight. Jesus enters a garden of fearfulness and loneliness where even his disciples fall asleep. So here we are. It's a cold spring evening. And for a moment, I just want you to put your creative hats on and try to envision the beauty and yet the airy sense of that night. Think of all that God and Jesus has done and encountered over the last three years, the miracles and the accusations, the love and the hatred, the demands and the questions, the accusations and the professions. Jesus has been chased and sought out and touched and scorned. But here is Jesus laboring in prayer. Here's the disciples struggling to stay awake human fatigue mixed with stress and confusion and they're taking hold of their bodies and their minds jerusalem is crowded and filled with tension which is also funny because see how history is repeating itself if you read matthew 2 which you will read in about six weeks or seven weeks from now remember when the wise men come and they're seeking a king and it says jerusalem was tense with what was happening even his birth there was tension and even in his death there was tension but this time, this time in John 18, religion is not just involved, but now it's working with the political powers. Look at verse 2. Look at what it says in verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And having procured a band of soldiers and some officers, they went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. John goes out of his way, did you notice, to bring Judas back into focus. Judas is the antagonist in this story. And it's noteworthy that this is the place where Judas might expect to find Jesus, since according to our passage, G Jesus often met there with his disciples. Now remember back in chapter 13 and 14? Jesus says to, John, to Judas in chapter 13, what you are going to do, do quickly. And he dismissed Judas and so Judah, Jesus is not in this garden avoiding arrest. He went out of his way to make himself available. One man says, what a calloused heart Judas showed in betraying Jesus at a spot made precious by fellowship and prayer with Jesus himself. And notice, we have a Roman contingent and a Jewish one. Our passage says there was a band of soldiers. Scholars tell us that is likely a cohort, which could have been as much as 1,000 men. Now, most scholars think there was somewhere between 200 and 600 officers. That gives you a different perspective. They didn't just show up with a, a little uh, militia. They marched over there somewhere between two and 600 soldiers armed with weapons and torches and lanterns. They were always afraid. It's only a week to go, the cowed gathered, remember, and cried out, Hosanna. And this is why it tells you they went, they went under the cover of darkness. There were hundreds of them. You see, we're told often in John that they feared, they feared the mob. They feared Jesus. They knew about his power. Remember, the memory of raising Lazarus from the dead is actually only days old. How do you arrest a man who has power over death? But Judas gives him the perfect opportunity. In the cover of darkness... When everybody's asleep, they can quickly go in, slip in, slip out, grab Jesus and his little crew who followed him, get the trials and the verdict in before the world even woke up. The fix could be in. And if you notice, they bring the weapons and the lanterns and the torches, almost as if they thought they were going to have to go look for Jesus in this garden. Do you remember when you used to play Spotlight? 
Do you ever do that? Some of you older ones, I don't know if you younger kids, if that's still a cool game. It was really cool when I was a kid. We'd go out after it got dark and we'd hide and someone had a flashlight and your job was to do this. It's almost as if they thought they were going to have to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and play spotlight to find Jesus. But that's not how it is, is it? All the people have turned against him. Creation itself has rejected him. Political power, religious power, Satan have all come together to eliminate the threat. Remember what God said to Satan? You will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And what is amazing is we see here that Jesus as God in a unique way, we begin to see his omniscience and his omnipotence. He's in control of the situation. Jesus doesn't hide. He's not afraid. He's not angry. He's not anxious. He's not impatient. He simply is. Because then we see a garden announcement. Hundreds of them come. Hundreds of Romans and Jewish police come. And why do they do it? It's almost as if they're afraid of this one person. One says they are hopelessly outnumbered by one. Look at verse 4 again. And Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Rather than running or hiding, he knows everything. He actually goes out and confronts them directly. Richard Phillips writes, Jesus proved himself to not only be the master of circumstances, but also the master of souls. And when they said that they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, he replies, I am he. And just like Matthew 18, when that, that angel comes, what happens here? They drew back and they fell to the ground. Now, these were Roman soldiers from a cohort. These were seasoned soldiers. And yet when Jesus says, I am, he is the culmination of seven other I am statements. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world, and I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. This should remind you of Exodus. When Moses stood before a burning bush and he heard the words, I am who I am, and utterly daunted, and this throng of armed veterans fall back into the ground helpless. I love what Alexander McLaren says. He says, I'm inclined to think here there was a moment when just a flash of Jesus' godness was displayed, and these soldiers are afraid. If you remember back in John chapter 10, he says he lays down his life and only he can take it up. Again, no one takes his life from him. But I want you to see if we're going to be compelled by his love. In the midst of this, in verses 1 to 12, in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, we see Jesus' love and protection. Because the second time he says, I am he, and let these men go. Even as he is facing death and betrayal, even as he knows Peter has run his mouth, we already know that someone ran away naked. If you read Mark chapter 10, someone's already bolted. And the other 10 are afraid. And this group of soldiers and police didn't just want Jesus, they wanted the whole crew. It was perfect. You see, if you want to get rid of someone, you got to get rid of the witnesses. So silence anyone who could make trouble. And yet here, Jesus says, let them go. Martin Luther says the greatest miracle that happened in Gethsemane is Jesus' providential protection of his disciples. One man says, here we see how the Son of God not only submits to death of his own accord, that by his obedience he may blot out our transgressions, but he also how he discharges the office of a good shepherd. That was one of his I am statements in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. Remember what he says? If they're mine, no one can pluck them out of my father's hand. Again, someone says the evangelist does not speak purely of their bodily life, but rather means that Christ, sparing them for a time, made provision for the eternal salvation. He writes, let us consider how great their weakness was. What do we think they would have done if they had been brought to the test? And don't you love that about God? I love listening to Don's testimony and how vulnerable and transparent he was to tell you there were times he just felt like he couldn't do it. He was embarrassed. But what did he say when he found out and discovered, God says, I don't need you to be strong. In fact, you're of more use to me when you're weak because then I can be strong. Oh, that we would learn again in our churches how to embrace our weakness 
And then you'll see a garden gospel. And I end with this. One last episode that John wants to highlight is impetuous Peter hops into action. Now, what do you think Peter was doing? He's one dude. There's 10 of them left. One guy's already taken off. Peter pulls out his sword, and he lops off the ear of Malchus, and there's likely six, seven, eight hundred people there. It's, one, it's hundreds against 11, and he thinks he's going to take them on. Doesn't that sound like Peter? Doesn't it sound like him? And yet, Simon Peter, having drew his sword, and Jesus says, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And I think there's a few reasons why Jesus said this. Number one, and we need to get this in our 2023 age, violence is not the gospel. Devin Park, please, if there's one thing you hear from me tonight, your job and mine is not to argue with lost people about morality. Our calling is to example the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ that changes our morality and will infect our culture. And so violence is not the way. Yelling and screaming. Jesus was in charge here. He was going to lay down his life. You know, I once heard one pastor talking about uh, the apostle Paul, and I, I love it when he's talking about him at Philippi, and he says, Paul must have been just an aggravating dude. Because if he was with Lydia, the seller of purple, and he was doing well, he could rejoice in the Lord. And then you arrest him and you whip him and you put him in stocks and bonds. And what's he doing at midnight? He's having a praise session and praying and everything happens. It just seemed no matter what you did to Paul, he was like, well, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Wouldn't that just be aggravating? And yet, it's fascinating. People get curious by it. The great urban myth about Pliny the Younger who was writing uh, back to his Caesar about arresting Christians. And one of the great things I love about that story, it says, I don't know what to think of these Christians, but I'll tell you this, they die well. This is what Paul, Jesus wants Peter to realize. Violence is not the gospel. Secondly, though, Jesus is teaching Peter that God's will and way is always better than his will or way. Now, don't forget, Peter has struggled with this gospel thing. I find it fascinating that Peter is the one that goes into action here. Remember, in Matthew chapter 16, after he says, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't shown you this, when he says, thou art the Christ, and then he announces to them that I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And then Peter, first off, says, uh, Lord, a word. Um, I, I don't like that plan. That's not the plan I had. And remember, Jesus goes from Peter, you are the rock. And then he says, get behind me, Satan. Now that's kind of whiplash of a perspective, isn't it? In the very next chapter in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration of Jesus where he flashes his godness, what does Peter want to do? He doesn't want to leave. He just says, let's build some tents and let's all just live, live here. And, and uh, talk about the selfishness and self sense The other disciples are still down the hill. And Peter's like, I don't care about them. I just want to have this hallelujah moment right here. And again, God has to rebuke him. And again, remember in John 13, when Jesus is going to wash their feet and he comes to Peter. And he's like, no, 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 I won't. You don't wash my feet. I'll wash yours. And then Jesus says, no, if I don't wash your feet, you'll be. And then he's like, well, now give me a bath. <laughs> Don't you love that about him? And then again, when Jesus says, I'm going to go die, Peter then announces, Lord, if everybody else here forsakes you, I won't. And he says that with them in earshot. See, I don't get really bent out of shape when I see churches have weird times because I just think about how awkward would it have been to be in that room? Imagine when you're at a business meeting and someone is saying, we're struggling, and then someone says, well, if the rest of you forsake Jesus, I won't. Because that's what Peter does. And then Jesus looks at him and says, listen, dude, before the sun comes up, you're going to deny me three times. There's actually probably a better explanation of this. See, Jesus stops Peter because Peter's solution isn't going to save anybody. Jesus' plan would make the way for untold millions to be made right with God. Peter was thinking about a way to save himself, maybe his nation, but Jesus was going to enact a plan that would offer salvation to the world. But believe it or not, there might be even another reason why Peter did this. I love this in my studies. I found out that if you wanted to let the uh, chief priest know that you had felt he was corrupt or inappropriate... You mutilated his ear. 
And Malchus, is, if you read later on, you'll find out in verse 25 of chapter 18 that Malchus was a relative to the high priest. And it could have been that Peter thought, well, look, I can't do anything, but I'm going to let these guys know that I think this whole priest thing is out of line. And he lops off his ear to make a religious point to try and put these guys on the defensive that I'm telling you this is a corrupt priesthood and you shouldn't be here. And it's of interest that John goes out of his way to tell us later that when Peter denies him a third time, it's because someone says, who is related to Malchus, who was a relative to the high priest, he goes, I know who you are. You're the guy that cut off my cousin's ear. And so this makes a lot more sense. And so the great point, of course, is Christ's sovereignty in submitting to the Father's will for him to die on the cross. Remember that great song? In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. So you have a garden revisited. You have a garden confrontation. You have a garden announcement. And then you have a garden gospel. So friends, the Bible is beautifully put together. And God saves real, not imaginary sinners. And before the cross, we can be completely and truly ourselves. What drives me as a pastor now in my middle ages is not to wow people with colorful language. It's not to wow people with programs or even mission initiatives. It's to get men and women, young and old, of all walks of life to realize it is safe to come to God and be truly yourself. To realize that Jesus was taken captive so you and I can be set free. So you don't have to bear your shame or your guilt. You don't have to do this. When the first Adam brought death into the world in a garden, Jesus, the second Adam, brought life into the world in a garden. This is the beauty of it. And this is why the garden is so significant in John in chapters 18 to 20. Because the garden becomes the place of redemption and not revolt. It becomes the great reversal, transforming the biblical garden from the place of cursing to the place of blessing. You see, God removed the first Adam from the garden. Remember, he drove him out. But he entered as the second Adam to surrender himself to the curse for the sake of us all. You see, it's funny. In our world today, unbelievers say that their sin represents their freedom. But believers recognize that sin is their bondage, and Jesus changes everything. Jesus allowed himself to be arrested in a garden so you and I can be set free from sin, our sin. You're now able to be honest with yourself. So if you're here tonight, what's enslaving you right now? Are you afraid but trying to convince yourself you're in control? Are you angry but trying to justify it with the wrongs others have done with you and to you? Are you bitter or anxious? Are you tired Are you carrying burdens and weights, putting on a happy face, chasing after dreams that either you can't seem to catch or they're never quite satisfied? And I tell you this over and over again, I'm not a salesman, I'm a client. God has made me live this out in my own life, in my family's life. You see, are you searching? Do you have questions? Do you feel paralyzed by the confusion of life around you? Then you need to realize you're no different than every one of the disciples and even every one of those soldiers in that mob. Here's the difference. Will you trust Jesus as the one who was taken captive for you so that you can be set free? Have you ever wondered? Again, I prayed about it this morning, Psalm 23. It's one of the pet peeves I have that we quote it at funerals. The person who has died, trust me, they're free if they know Jesus. Psalm 23 needs to be read in church to the living David didn't write it when he was dying. He wrote it when he was alive and living. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and David says, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the future for anyone who will trust Jesus Christ. Jesus prepares a place, a meal. Jesus is with us, and he guides us, and he protects us, and he provides for us. So let me ask you tonight, what garden are you in? Are you in the Garden of Eden or the Garden of Gethsemane? 
And Christian, if you're here today, when was the last time you thought about and applied the freedom Jesus provides for you? Are you still tempted to live like you're weighed down when in fact you've been set free? Again, I'll I'll admit stuff to you. One of my favorite movies is The Count of Monte Cristo. And in it, it amazes me that when uh, Armanus found this wonderful treasure, he has spent years falsely accused and in prison, and he's finally set free. And if you remember, the book in the movie says that he was richer than anyone in all of the world, and yet he buys this magnificent castle, and yet when Yakov, Yakupov goes in to find him that day, and he's in this bedroom, his bedroom's the size of this auditorium, and he has this palatial bed, and when Yakupov goes in to find him, where does he find him? Not in this beautiful beautiful, wonderful bed of a rich man. He finds him sleeping on the floor beside the bed with nothing but a pillow. He's richer than anyone, still living like a slave, like a prisoner. That's the tragedy of too many Christians. You and I have been set free because Jesus was taken captive. He has given us all of his love, all of his forgiveness, all of his righteousness. You and I should be the most joyful people on the planet We've been set free so we can be compelled by his love. And whether you lose a child or whether you've experienced rebellious children or whether you've gone through the heartache of church rejection or a failed marriage or whether you've been hurt and abused by someone or you struggle with depression or anxiety or mental illness, whether you've lost a job or whether you feel like everything you turn, touch turns to rust, do you realize you are still a child of God? And you can be completely yourself and come to him because Jesus has been taken captive so you and I can be set free. This is what I want you to take from this passage. It should amaze us and encourage us and our response should be worship. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. But notice with me, Jesus has plans. He knows everything. He's control of everything, has a purpose for everything. So when we're facing stuff, trust Jesus. Jesus is foolishness to the world, a stumbling block to the Jews. Many will read this passage and indeed the Bible and will mock the hopeless failure of Jesus. Some will shake a fist at this moral monster and accuse Jesus and God of being moral monsters. And our calling is no different than that of Jesus. It's not to save folks. It's to tell the world about Jesus and to live as those who have met and been changed by him. Be of good cheer. God has overcome the world. And these verses prove it. So Devin Park, where does your mind go when you think about life? Do you spend more time rehearsing your issues Or do you remind yourselves of the promises of God? Do you focus on your problems? Or do you bring them to Jesus who prays for you? Again, Scotty Smith says this, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, Philippians 4, 5. He says we can risk gentleness because Jesus is near to us in two ways. In proximity, he lives inside of us and he's with us. And in time, because he's returning soon by the calendar of his grace. And so, Devin, I leave you with these words. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Now go live that way. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the stillness and quietness of this room. Lord, I do have confidence that you're going to work, not because I preached a decent sermon, but because we read the living word of God and we've made much of it. We have sang your word, read your word, and proclaimed your word. And now as we close out a packed weekend, And maybe there's even physical fatigue. There's the mundane tasks of a Monday that's just around the corner. And Satan will whisper into our ears, it's a manic Monday. But may we remember that you are the one that holds the seven lampstands and walks amongst the seven candlesticks. You are the one that has compassion You were the one that prays for us. I am so thankful that even as I pray to my Father right now, Jesus Christ prays for me. And you were the one that has set me and us free if we will but trust you. Lord, what I do pray is by your Spirit, the men and women here and that have been here over this weekend will remember something that has been spoken to them. 
and they will have the courage to act upon it, to go and ask someone to forgive them, to go and befriend someone, to go and sacrifice, to be able to step forward and say, I will serve, or I'll become a member, or I will lead this, or I'll head this up. Maybe someone needs to ask for forgiveness and let go of bitterness. Maybe some parents need to trust you with their children. Maybe there are some marriages that need to be renewed by your strength. Lord, maybe even the pastors of this church have needed a fresh reminder that they serve you and not the church. They can give their lives to the church, but only you gave your life for the church. Lord, I just pray that men and women, old and young here, that have been here for years or are brand new will realize that the only thing that makes this church beautiful is as they glorify, worship, and trust you and serve each other. Lord, may we hold these programs and facilities and what the reputation of Devon Park Baptist Church is with open hands and be more concerned about the worship, adoration, and love and glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for their missions efforts in 2024. I pray for Seth and Don and all the missionaries supported by this church that they will not grow weary in well-doing and they will realize both the blessing and the responsibility that churches like this support them and us. So Lord, truly help us to be a family. Help us to go into this week and look for opportunities to live out the gospel and to share the word of God, to encourage each other, to become more aware, to remember that you looked up and you felt and you responded. And Lord, whatever these men and women face in sickness and in health, Till death do us part. It's not just marriage vows. It's the anthem of a Christian. Because you are with us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So we are more than conquerors. So Lord, may we can be compelled by your love. May this church serve you in this Christmas season as it barrels down on them. And look forward to a new year as you tarry. And no matter what the chaos of the world and the wars and rumors of wars and the political upheaval and shifting and inflation and all of the things that come our way. Lord, may we realize this building is not your church. The people gathered are. And may they find joy in serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Devin Park. Thank you so much for having me.